is Archibald Edmund Gates, Murder Fitzwilliams, Carl Smith and Sparks. And I collect names the way some folks collect hearts. I can out jump, out kick, out spit, out swim, out yell, out fight anyone here. And so, when I say to you, I am going to tell you the greatest story that I know. I want you to know that this is not some stupid character. You see, when I say the word great, I mean it in a way you could have never heard the word used before. For me, the meaning of a story does not come from within the story itself. It's not the message in the Bible, so to speak. No. Instead, the meaning of a story should surround and fulfill the story. It is the ocean upon which the Bible falls. And so for me, the greatest story is that story which best goes in this rock here before us. That star right there. And best convinces you that that boy is a thing. Now that's the introduction to the story that I used to tell when I worked as a historical interpreter at a Boy Scout camp in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains in New Mexico. For three magnificent summers, I was a logger from the year 1914. And every single night, I would get up on that stage that had mountains stretching behind me to my right and the plains stretching endlessly behind me to my left. And I would get on that stage and I would roar stories about Venom, Brother, Vengeance. And it was like I was the tungsten filters and an incandescent bulb. I was a convict for all that electricity, every eyeball was on me, and I had never felt so alive. Now, when my senior year of college came around, the time came for me to decide what I was going to do with the rest of my life. I decided I needed to do something serious. And coincidentally, that semester, I had just read Jurassic Park. And so I decided that storytelling, as much as I loved it, was a childish thing, and the time had come to put childish things behind me. And so instead, I was going to dedicate my life to helping to resurrect the dinosaurs. <laughs> and so I applied to, and got into, the University of Rochester's PhD program in biophysics. And I hate to be the one to tell you guys this, but we are very far from resurrecting the dinosaurs. <laughs> Which I might have known if I had taken a biology class since 10th grade, but I hadn't. I had studied physics in college. And so they put me into graduate level biochemistry and cell biology. And suddenly, I was the dumbest person in the world. It was really hard. I started to get really stressed out. I got these stress rashes on my hands. I, I had to study that wouldn't go away easily. They lived for words. And I started to think that I had made a huge mistake. All I could think about was that stage in the I'd been happy there. I was good at that. Why did I give it up? And so I realized that I needed to find some way to bring storytelling into my life in Rochester. And after thinking about it for a little while, I realized exactly what I needed to do. I write stories for strangers on a mechanical typewriter. Dying for each one. I've written over a thousand of these stories, and the way that it works is like this. I sit with my sign, it says, it's in the stories, every night you wait. And the curious uh, will come up and will say, What is this? And I say, Give me a first line, give me a character in an unusual situation, give me anything else, something to work with. And in five to ten minutes, I'll write you a story, I'll ask you questions throughout. And at the end of it, you take the story, and I take your dime, and go to the place. Now, I need to give you an example of these stories are. I wrote this story for an extremely shy little girl by the name of Lily, who was at the Rochester Museum and Science Center with her mother and her aunt last winter. After breakfast, a slimy, grungy, dirty, gross buzz, Lily the Frog decided she was going to jump all the way to the moon. So she went down to her favorite lily pad in the middle of the pond, and she stretched and she yawned, and she wiggled her butt. With the great big old sprung, she leapt up in the air. She leapt up past the bugs, and with a gulp, gulp, 
She ate too much fruit pass. She loved to pass the birds under the church. She ate too much fruit pass. She loved to pass the clouds, pass the airplanes, and pass all the balloons. She moved through the inky void of space, past stars and planets, and she moved so fast that the people on Earth thought that she was a shooting star. He made wishes on her. Wishes for ponies for the superpower of flight for the return of the lost ponies. And then she saw it, huge and white, growing all the time. It was the moon. And with a thump, she landed. What did she do? She had herself a dinner of slimy, crunchy, dirty, gross bugs. And think I took stories all over Rochester. I took stories at the farmer's market. I took stories at the uh, Museum of Play, at the Rochester Museum of Science, as I mentioned. I took stories at bars, at art museums. I took stories uh, last summer. I was writing for Science of America at their offices in Lower Manhattan, in Lower Manhattan. And on my lunch break, I would go down to Battery Park with the Statue of Liberty in the background. Write stories for the, uh, uh, for the people there. That's for the tourists that were there. So. Now, something that happened while I was doing all this that I did not expect. Remember that I started this project as a way to get as far away from my research as possible. Uh, but something happened in the time that I was doing this, something that I could never have expected. I started to really love the research that I was doing. I joined the nanomembranes research group. And we studied glass filters that are 10,000 times thinner than human hair. And we want to use these filters as a way to make a portable dialysis system so that people whose kidneys fail don't have to be go, go to a dialysis clinic three days a week. Instead, they can be perfectly mobile. They don't have to be struck to a machine for eight hours a day. It's very cool research. And so I started to wonder was there some way? to bring these two sides of my life together. Could I, for instance, use the 10 cent stories as a way to teach kids science concepts? I wrote this story for a little boy that spent most of the time I was writing the story hiding behind his father's leg at the Rochester Museum of Science. Once upon a time, there were three little pigs. Three little pigs had a problem. The problem was this. They would build their home Sticks, straw, brown paper clips, or carrots, copper, titanium, it did not matter. Whatever they built their home, they got full of them. And he would huff, and he would huff, and he would blow their house down. And the little piggies were getting upset. They were getting sick of having to rebuild their home every single, single day. So they went to their friends at NASA. And their friends at NASA put them in a rocket ship and sent them 250 miles straight up into the air, the International Space Station. And that's where they made the new home. He went to the Russians, who had their own space program. And he paid them scabs and money to send them in their own rocket. And he went up into space, and he approached the International Space Station. And he got on the radio and he said, Little pigs, little pigs, please let me in. <laughs> and the piggy said, Shh, not where they are, aren't you? And the big bad wolf said, Shh, and I will huff, and I will huff, and I will blow your spaceship in. And he put on the spacesuit, and he pushed out the air pump, and he tripped it because the International Space Station. The piggy's watching from the window, could do nothing but watch as he got closer and closer. Big bad wolf. He huffed. And he huffed. He took a deep breath. And he took off his helmet. And he blew as hard as he could. But in the vacuum and microgravity of space, his breath was like a rocket. And he launched himself backwards all the way to Mars. <laughs> now, I write a lot of stories for kids. And I love to do it. The stories I write for adults are different. They have an emotional depth that the children's stories don't often have. Sometimes people will open up to me just because I'm a stranger. 
There was one time I was at the pier, and a woman came up to me, and she said, I would like you to write a story about a woman who loves a man, but can't tell the man that she loves him. I said, oh boy, this is some great stories right here. <laughs> but give me a little more, give me something more to work with. Why can't this woman tell the man that she loves him? She said, well, I'm married. <laughs> I want to tell you about the most difficult story I've ever been asked to write. I was in Cornell Women's Festival, and a woman came up to me. She explained to me that two years ago, I was in the Festival, and that ever since that had happened, she had struggled to find joy. She went through a routine. She was a new daughter. She did all the things she wanted done, but Nothing kind of saved her. So she wanted to write a story about that. About where she should look. It's time. Enjoy. What do you say? What do you find? Now I'm on my own. I didn't know the answers I had, but it's trying not to make it clear. But she was there, and she was waiting. Spots and great days, and time to its I gave her the story, she gave me a dime. These stories, I think, all the thousands of them, they kept me sane during a time in my life when I often felt lonely and worthless. More than that. They explained that they were about to go and pick up the man's father, who was turning 90 years old, 90 years old that week. They were going to celebrate his birthday with blue cheese burgers. They wanted me to write a story about a caribou named Joe. And as we talked, it came out that the father, the old man, had been seeing and talking to a caribou named Joe, and having conversations with him. He told this to his son and his daughter-in-law, and they didn't think too much about it, the old man is but when the caribou cropped up in my stories a few more times, the son got curious, and he told me that he learned that in Scandinavian mythology, the caribou is seen as a creature that can pass between the worlds of the living and the dead, and that often serves as a spirit guide for those about to make the same journey. Hallucinates a dangerous animal in his room. But he's able to wrestle the experience into a story. He has a conversation with the character. He offers an empathy and advice. He tells the story to his son, and it's never a good thing when an old man begins to see things that aren't there. But the son is able to make it into his own story. And more than that, he's able to tie the dots together in a way that give him some kind. Stories can make the world a stranger and more hopeful place. 